Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction Company, taking a look at some of the guns that they're selling in their upcoming February of 2017 regional auction. And today we're taking a look at a Colt revolver. Now this is a 1902 Colt revolver, which is actually an 1878 Colt revolver, which is kind of the follow-up to the 1877 Colt revolvers, which were made as an expansion on the market of the 1873 Colt revolver. So let's explain that out. Obviously the 1873 was the iconic Colt single action army, which as the name suggests was single action. Now Colt had kind of distrusted the idea of double action revolvers for quite some time, kind of thought they were too fragile, too complex, didn't really give you all that much extra benefit. But by the late 1870s it I guess became clear that this was a major market segment that Colt really ought to address or else they were just going to lose it to everybody else, whether they thought the idea was good or not. So in 1877 Colt released the Thunderer and the Lightning, which were uh, a 38 and a 41 caliber double action revolver. And they got used, they were reasonably popular, but they did not take off the way that the 1873 had done. As Colt had kind of been concerned with, they were in fact kind of fragile guns. So in 1878 they came out with the Double Action Army or Frontier model, Double Action Frontier revolver, which is sort of this guy. Um, this was a large frame gun, bigger than the Thunder and the Lightning, it was a 45 caliber gun, although they did make it in pretty much every caliber imaginable at the time, from everything from 3220 up to 476 Ely. Uh, although the, the primary cartridge that was used in this was the 45 Colt. Now the Army tested this revolver, the US Army, in 1879 and rejected it. They found it was a bit of a fragile gun, it was a bit easy to get out of time, and the, the hammer spring was a bit weak on it. So particularly with military ammunition, which was kind of known for having hard primers, the gun wouldn't always reliably set off primers. And you know that seems like an easy thing to fix, but that's all it takes to get chucked out of a military trial, especially at that time. So Army had tried this in 1879 and rejected it. Now Colt kept on making them, and they were, they were never barn burning successes. They sold in total a little more than 51,000 of these guns uh, on the commercial market. But the Philippine conflict came up, or the, the Philippine-American War. In, right at the end of the 1800s. And this is, this is actually the revolver that is the real revolver involved with this story of our 38s can't kill these Filipino guerrillas, we need a 45 again. Now this goes back to the Philippine insurrection, the US Army is fighting Filipinos in the Philippine Islands, um, in particular the Moros, and they did in fact have some trouble with kind of wimpy 38 Smith & Wesson revolvers not being reliable stoppers against really angry, pissed off, and um, uh, very warrior-like Filipino fighters. So yes, at that time some of the officers who were there simply dug out their old single action armies from the cavalry service and used those. Well the army actually bought 4,600 of these revolvers to help solve this problem in 1902. These weren't actually for the army, these were purchased for the Philippine Constabulary, the police force, the American police force in the Philippines, and they had in fact wanted a 45 caliber revolver. So these were available on the market, and Colt came in and did a couple of modifications to the gun to solve some of the problems that it had in 1879. Most notably they gave it a stronger hammer spring, and that made it kind of difficult to shoot, made a very heavy double action trigger, so they made the trigger longer so that you got more leverage on it, but in order to make it longer they had to make the trigger guard bigger so that the trigger would still fit. And that's what you get with this revolver, is it's uniquely identifiable for this really big trigger guard and very long trigger in the gun. You'll sometimes see these referred to as Alaskan models, the idea being that you can shoot this with heavy gloves on. That's true, but that's not where this design actually came from. It came from the Philippines. It was the Philippine model, in fact, uh, the model of 1902. So just for comparison's sake, I went and grabbed a standard 1878 Colt double action, and you can really see the difference in the trigger guards and the triggers themselves here. They really substantially lengthened the trigger and the trigger guard to fit it. So we'll put this one away. That's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about this guy. Now these guns were actually not designed by Sam Colt. He had unfortunately died by this point. These were designed by William Mason, who had been one of Colt's chief 
engineers and chief uh, uh, factory shop superintendents. And there are some mechanically interesting elements to it. You'll notice there are no notches here on the cylinder for cylinder stops. Instead, let me take this apart, there's a little button here, push the button in, we can pull the cylinder guide rod, or cylinder axis pin, out. This is a loading gate revolver, so I'll open the loading gate and we can pull the cylinder out. And this one's a bit worn, but you can see all we have are ratchet fingers back here. There are no stops, stop notches cut into the cylinder. And the way this actually functioned was to use the hand and the trigger to lock the cylinder in place rather than a bolt that came out of the bottom of the frame to lock the cylinder. So if we look at the hand here you can see that there's actually a second element, geometric element to it down there. When I lock the hammer back, one of the, the these two are going to work together in conjunction with the stops, the teeth on the back of the cylinder. That's what locks the cylinder in place, that's what times it. Now these have a reputation for being relatively easy to cut, get out of time, um, which is a, a well deserved reputation. This isn't as good of a system as it turns out. So normally you'd have a bolt on most revolvers, you have a bolt that lifts up out of the bottom of the frame here to more securely lock the cylinder in place when you're actually firing. Now this was in some ways a holdover from previous Colt products. These actually used the exact same barrel and ejector assemblies off of the 1873 single action army. So our ejector rod just comes back the exact same way. These are still gate loading revolvers, so you'll pop open the loading gate, you'll put it at half cock, which on this revolver is a little finicky, and uh, spin the cylinder around. We can eject our empty cases one at a time and then load new cartridges in through that loading port, and then close it, and you're ready to shoot. Now it's interesting, comparing this trigger pull to the one on the standard gun, down here, uh, this definitely does have a heavier trigger, definitely has does have a more commanding snap of the hammer, um, and the longer trigger really does help. Um, I can certainly see army guys using two fingers to fire this, this revolver, because I think a lot of people would, would find themselves doing that. Probably not a good idea, but something that would have happened. It's a stiff trigger pull on that, but I'd rather have a stiff trigger pull than a very nice trigger pull that doesn't always actually fire the gun. So to me this, the Model 1902 here really embodies this interesting change in dynamic from the world of the Old West to the world of industrial mechanized warfare of World War I. Um, these revolvers really kind of have one foot in each of those worlds. We have a double action uh, system, Colts finally coming up into the, you know, the mainstream modern technology at this point, but at the same time there's still literal parts off the single action army, the classic Old West gun. So it's really, it's this cool mixture of, of both worlds, and on top of that it's got this distinct special connection to the the Philippine insurrection, which is just a, an interesting and in many ways forgotten conflict itself. So I think it's a really cool model of revolver. Uh, this one is, it's also kind of in that place where it's got all the history to it, but it's not the most aesthetically perfect gun, so it really does bring it into the range of some folks uh, who are interested in having them but can't afford the premium for a really gorgeous example. So if you're interested in having this, take a look at the description text below. You'll find a link there to Rock Island's catalog page on it. Um, I believe it is in a lot with a couple other guns, so you can see those guns as well. Uh, take a look at their pictures, Rock Island's pictures and description, and their price estimates, and if you decide that it's the one that you want to get, you can place a bid right online through their website. Thanks for watching.